Okay, we're back on a Monday morning with Scott Harshberger. He is an attorney. He was the Attorney General of the State of Massachusetts. He joins us by phone from Boston. Hi, Scott. Thank you for joining us today. Jay, thank you very much for having me, and I'm sure you're having much, much better weather in, uh, in Honolulu and Hawaii than we are here in Boston, Massachusetts. <laughs> I feel your pain. I feel your pain. <laughs> and I feel your pain. <laughs> but, but speaking about right. pain, you know, the country's in pain. Uh, we feel it. We see it. We hear it on the news uh, every day. It's a, become an avocation. Whether people admit it or not, they spend hours every day following, you know, the shenanigans going on in Washington with this government. Um, and it should be of concern to everyone, especially the lawyers who are presumably steeped in the rule of law. And you've gotten heavily involved in that. And I wonder if you could tell us the state of affairs in the government and uh, why we should be concerned about, the, about the, um, the, the failure to abide by the rule of law by this administration. Well, I think that the, the major concern that I have and that we've been all trying, at least many have been trying to articulate, is that we have seen uh, the executive, the President of the United States, engage in what seems to be a, an intentional and systematic attack on core legal uh, democracy principles and values, including the rule of law, the independence of the judiciary, the independence of the Justice Department, and to basically take the position that the rule of law is not a check and balance, is not a guardrail, but rather is something to be used primarily for personal self-interested and ideological reasons. Now, not to be too uh, arcane about this, the fact is the rule of law, the core demo institutions of democracy, uh, the Constitution, are center posts uh, which are meant to ground us, uh, to ensure that we can disagree without being uh, disagreeable, to have arguments, to have debates, to have freedom of speech, but with some core common ground and common cause understanding that there are limits, there are checks and balances. There's an executive role, congressional role, a role for the courts, a role for citizens, and what is happening today is an abandonment, uh, a systematic attack on these, and we're not, frankly, seeing any defense, particularly from lawyers, Jay, of the rule to protect. We're sworn by the oath of the office we take in every state to uphold the law and the Constitution and the laws of this, of this Commonwealth in Massachusetts, and those are being undermined. They're also being become highly partisan, and I think without re – well, I speak as a Democrat. On the Republican side, we're also seeing elected officials who are accepting, justifying, and even praising these systematic attacks on core democracy institutions that threaten the fragility – the very strength of our democracy, and every citizen – could be deeply concerned about this, regardless of party. You know, it's been, you know we've, been, we've been watching this uh, since, what, uh, 2016, 2017. And, uh, and to focus on the time period, I remember the, uh, the, you know, the protests right after the inauguration of Donald Trump, where people said, not my president. Um, and it was like a cold bath of water to find that he was, he was our president, for many reasons. But, you know, things have, things have moved on from there. Uh, and I wonder if you could comment on the sea changes involved. We were concerned, yes, we were, in January 2017, but here we are in 2019, going to 2020. Has it gotten worse? Is it the same? You know, what, what, are, the, what are the evolutions we should be noticing here in the past, what, two, almost three years? It's a very, very good point. And I think that, um, and, and it's, you know, to some extent, sort of easy to criticize a president who feels that he's constantly under attack because of the questions about the legitimacy of his uh, election, and that's how he articulates it, that, uh, that he's never been accepted and therefore it's a constant 
attacked by the media, which are the enemy of the people, he calls uh, uh, the press. Um, the Democrats who disagree with him are you know, socialists, uh, whistleblowers who uh, are tied to the protections of law, are you know, viewed as terrorists. Um, it's anybody who is attacks or criticizes uh, the president is deemed to be uh, uh, sort of a traitor to the cause. And that kind of, that kind of action has become increasingly uh, apparent as, and as the power of the executive, the desire to control, the desire, frankly, to be almost a king or a monarch um, and refuse to have any constraints uh, is, being, uh, is being carried out. The change is, the change, I think, is, and I don't only mean to attribute this, the death of John McCain, Senator John McCain, for whatever reason meant that the end of the backbone or spine of Republican senators who know better, for whatever reason, um, the, the, the fact that John McCain has not been there to try to hold the Republican Party to its principles, not Democratic principles, but its own principles in terms of standards of decency, of honesty, of integrity, uh, of upholding the Constitution and the constitutional balances. The role of the Senate has become, the Republican Party has simply become the party of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And he is operating by, by, by virtue of his tweets, by virtue of his control of the media. Um, I think it has escalated dramatically. And more importantly, he has been successful in my view, Jay. Mm -hmm. He has been successful because he is convincing an unbelievable number of our citizens that he is under attack, that the, anybody who criticizes him is an enemy of the people, um, and has essentially eliminated dissent mm -hmm. as a meaningful uh, factor here. Mm -hmm. um, and we can rely on the courts and all that, but the fact of the matter is that you're seeing what I consider to be a consolidation of power in the name of the president, not in terms of the legitimate public policy or interest that the president represents. And, uh, and it's totally become a political partisan effort. Well, let's, let's, talk, about, Sorry. let's talk about the, uh, the role of the attorney general. Now, you've, you've been in that role in, Ma in Massachusetts, and you can appreciate what it's like to be the attorney general in a... In a democratic society. Um, and in, in, uh, in the national scene, we have dramatic changes that have taken place recently uh, with regard to the Department of Justice and the Attorney General. Those changes um, are of great concern. Can you talk about that? I think that the performance of uh, Attorney General Barr has been shocking to me. Uh, this is a man that served as Deputy Attorney General uh, in the early 90s when I was Attorney General in Massachusetts. Um, and while a somewhat conservative, uh, certainly appropriately, with the, uh, seemed to be appropriately reflecting simply uh, conservative principles, um, now as Attorney General uh, has become essentially viewed his role as being twofold. One is to be the president's lawyer. The, pre the, law the president certainly wants that to be the case. That that's what he criticized the former Attorney General Jeff Sessions for. That's what he criticized former head of the FBI Jim Comey for, that they were not loyal to him. Loyalty to him was the key uh, in his mind. Uh, and these were viewed as independent. They, they acted, felt they had some obligations to the institution. Sessions therefore got fired. Comey got fired. Uh, and what you see throughout the administration is anybody who was not loyal to President Trump and tried to fulfill his legal, his or her legal responsibilities is there no more. Jim Mattis, Rex Tillerson, any number of cabinet secretaries uh, who, who left because of that. Now, the attorney general usually is considered to be well, perhaps a partisan to understand that the first and foremost, the responsibility of the attorney general is the law and the facts uh -huh. to represent the public interest not the president, mm -hmm. to represent the people's interests, not the private interest, the partisan interest of a party. 
Now, that may, the philosophy may be more conservative than mine. It might well be policies that are different than mine, but the argument was about policy, not about person. Mm -hmm. And what has been shocking to me is Attorney General Barr, beginning with his handling of the Mueller report, uh, essentially becoming uh, a spokesperson uh, as a personal attorney for the president defender. Mm -hmm. He justifies it by his view of the unitary executive, which almost no constitutional scholar that I know of agrees with, even though uh, there is a there has been increasing focus by him on that. Mm -hmm. And essentially, you have no checks and balances in the Department of Justice. Above all, the attorney general, mm -hmm. whether Democrat or Republican in any state, Hawaii or elsewhere, job is his responsibility to the people, to the law and the facts, mm -hmm. not to partisan politics. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been a grave, grave change. Well, you know, in, here at Christmas time, here at Christmas yeah. time, Scott, I am always, in fact, we are all always reminded of the Christmas Carol by, by uh, Charles Dickens. And in the, in the Christmas Carol by, by Charles Dickens, there's the ghost of Christmas future. And I think we ought to be thinking about that now, because if these processes, uh, these uh, sea changes that you've described, these conditions that have emerged under this administration continue, we are going to have a different world. Can you describe what the ghost of Christmas future is for the United States uh, in the future, in a future under Donald Trump and his administration? Uh, let me, I think, first of all, I. I do want to focus on one problem, which is, I think, and what mobilized us as lawyers defending American democracy, not the only group to do this, by the way, was that the legal profession was remaining silent. That is, of all the interest groups, of all the groups that exist, the one profession that takes an oath of office explicitly to uphold the law and the Constitution are lawyers. And when you have a situation where lawyers either approve of these kinds of fundamental, fundamental erosions of checks and balances and powers and limits on the abuse of power, and you see them systematically being eroded by the actions of the executive, and do nothing, speak, do not even try to speak truth to power, then we have failed. But we are the one instant profession that has a responsibility, I believe, to call this out and speak truth to power, regardless of party. And therefore, you look forward. If this continues, and I, 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 I believe, I think we're now understanding how fragile democratic institutions are, how much they depend upon some poor assumption of civility, of integrity, of decency, of expressions of, 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 of free press, of independence of judiciary, independence of law enforcement, of institutions and public servants that we're seeing in the impeachment hearings, people who will do their duty regardless of who the president is, who have served for Republican presidents and Democratic presidents, who are willing to tell, to speak to what they believe to be problems, and then to be ridiculed not only ridiculed, but attacked by the president and attacked personally by members of the Republican Party cross-examining them, we are very close to the 1930s rise of the, of the fascists in Germany, in my view. This is exactly the game plan that we saw years ago that we say can't happen again. The future could well lie in what we have seen in the past and we cannot simply assume that here we are in America with this democracy that these institutions will hold when there is such a systematic effort at every level to undermine them. So in 1968, uh, LDAD was created, the Lawyers for the Defense of American Democracy, uh, at Harvard, as I understand it, and, and it has existed all those years. But, but the Trump administration has, has given it a uh, a more important mission these days, and it is uh, under your guidance or your leadership, it has taken on the burden of making lawyers aware, or at least increasing their awareness of the problem. Can you tell us what LDAT has done in the last year or so? 
Uh, this, uh, the Lawyers Defending American Democracy, was created uh, at the uh, 50th reunion of our Harvard Law School class um, in uh, last October, uh, which one of which was an eminent professor from Yale who happens to have given the name of Adele. Um, and my brother, others. you mean my brother Gene, of course. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I mentioned the Harvard connection, not, not to make it well, it was Harvard Law School. But the key was, here we were lawyers coming back to reunion 50 years after we graduated from college, from law school, at a time that was equally in crisis in America. That so many people forget that that was the time of Vietnam, the protests in Vietnam, civil rights movement, just following the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy, of, of a turmoil uh, within the system, which ended up, among other things, with the impeachment of Richard Nixon, uh, the, the, the Watergate disclosures, but also the firing of an attorney general, which led to the resignations of, uh, of, of, of attorneys general when the firing of Archibald Cox. And the one thing that I recall, we all remembered was, the legal profession stood and delivered, not as Republicans or Democrats, but heads of law firms, deans of law schools, the American Bar Association, bar associations all over the country said this was wrong, that we had to continue to preserve civil rights and civil liberties. We had to preserve the independence of the attorney general and special counsel. We had to ensure that the court that the, Congress, the powers of Congress were upheld and could not be subverted by the executive. In other words, we had a crisis which, about which many have written, but John Meacham uh, most particularly, uh, a, a crisis of our democracy. And among others, the legal profession stood tall and said, this shall not stand. It stood and delivered protecting and defending the Constitution and the rule of law. Today, I cannot see any movement by an independent legal profession to stand and deliver. And Lawyers Defending American Democracy was an effort to gather the lawyers who believed that this was our role, not a partisan issue, to try to assemble Republicans and Democrats to take a stand on behalf of the rule of law and core principles, freedom of the media, independence of judiciary, the civility uh, not attacking people because of their race or creed, those core principles. And we have managed to accumulate that over 800 quite prominent lawyers uh, who have signed. It is not that as in, a, in a, this era we are concerned. There are not as many as we would like. We have had limited, I would say, limited, if any, impact because, as you point out, Jay, things have gotten worse, not better, in the last year. And for whatever reason, it's not news that a core lawyers stand for the rule of law. If we were stand, if we were all here attacking personally in a vicious partisan way, we would probably get more attention. Uh, I am pleased that a group like Checks and Balances, which represents conservative Republicans, is getting some play, making some of the same points that we're making about the rule of law. And people like Charles Freed and Larry Tribe um, and people like George Conway are being heard to some extent. But I'm very concerned, Jay, at having a negligible impact on public opinion and, more importantly, on our fellow lawyers. What are, why are people not listening? I don't understand. Well, that's a really good question. It's, it's, you raised the question no, before not. about why they're supporting Trump, uh, you know, despite all the things he does and doesn't do. So I guess the question say, is, if I'm, if I'm a lawyer, they would say, go ahead. Jay, here's the thing. I have talked, I've, I've, I've seen, I've watched the impeachment, I've watched the impeachment hearings. I hear people like former attorney, former attorney general and Congressman William McCollum. Uh, I hear you know, articulate good lawyers who will stand and, 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 and take the position that they are not, they agree with the rules that, we are undermining the rule of law, that we have Attorney General Barr going to the Federalist Society, an event sponsored by Facebook, of all things, uh, for the Federalists. Uh, Attorney General Barr speaking about, speaking
speaking, saying that it is the lawyers who are being critical, Democrats who are being critical of the president who are undermining the rule of law. The subpoenas, the subpoena power of Congress is being challenged as being, you know, a disruption. The, the, the insistence of Congress on the right to be to hear from executives, to hold the executive accountable, to hold hearings is being considered to be is it, they're using the rhetoric that we use, which is it, they claim it's undermining the rule of law. They're claiming it is violating all the rules of decency. It is, to me, a 1980, a George Orwell world yes. where the same words mean different things depending on your ideological or partisan view. Well, so 800 lawyers have signed off on the letter. Where has it gone? Um, and I suppose the second part of that question is, so it lands on my desk. Why, in the average case, do I not do something about it? What passes my mind when I receive this letter? Uh, what fails to motivate me? What, what, do I, what do I do with this letter, and what have people been doing with it? Well, I think there's, there, there's an excellent question, and I think we probably all have many, have had many responses. But one has been, one that has been, I think, most disturbing to me uh, is that people are afraid to sign the letter. That is, they may be in law firms where clients might object. They may be in situations where it's viewed as partisan. Uh, it's ideological. It's too partisan. We're, we're too partisan. We're mostly all of us either Democrats or liberals of some kind. Uh, we keep saying we're, we, we want to encourage Republicans to join us. We're not. It, it, it cannot be partisan in a democracy to stand and insist that the rule of law, the core legal and democracy principles apply. That is not a partisan statement unless you believe that equal justice, that fairness, due process, freedom of speech are, are you know, are, viola are ideological concepts. So one is, the defense is that it's partisan. The second one is that if I sign, if I sign up, it becomes public, I may be criticized by clients, or by others who don't agree with me uh, in this environment. That's one approach. Uh, the second one is others who could rightly think that just signing a statement in this day and age isn't uh, good enough. So you got it. You 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 need some sort of action. Some some maybe are joining lawyers for good government or joining other organizations that are the ACLU and others that are that are participating actively in certain things. And I commend that. Many of our members are doing that. Uh, our point is we're, we're trying not to be just advocates for particular issues. We're trying to be advocates for something that really isn't a special interest. It's sort of the broad public interest in the rule of law. And to, to many, many lawyers, the third point is here, Jay, many lawyers, this is vague. They don't, they don't understand this. They don't see this as being what I see as being uh, the actions of the president as being abuses of power. They think that the Democrats, I've heard many of uh, my colleagues say, well, the Democrats are just as bad. Look, the Democrats are just as bad. Look at Hunter Biden. Look at look at uh, the press appears biased against the president of the United States. You know, the Mueller report was, you know, was designed to get him. You Democrats have never accepted his election. So all kinds of justifications and excuses by lawyers, just like fellow citizens, for not being willing to stand up and simply defend the core con idea that there are core principles that must exist or things fall apart. The center will not hold. And we, if it, lawyers won't do this, who will? Yes. Oh, what a great question. Um, you know, we all went to law school. We learned about the, the federal government, the balance of power, the Constitution. Constitution. Constitutional law, as I understand it, is a required course in every law school in the country. Um, and yet, for some reason, and I would like to ask you about this, for some reason, uh, the bar in general, and you can say there are exceptions, I, I would treat the 800 as an exception rather than the rule. Um, the, the bar in general doesn't understand the crisis we're in. Uh, they're out there. They're practicing. They're doing their job. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to get into a controversial situation. Uh, they recognize or they appreciate wrongly, I think, 
that, um, that there's, there's a divisiveness among lawyers as there is a divisiveness among the society in general that has been created over the past few years. So they don't want to take a chance. They don't want to take any risk. You know, I, I suppose that's a business concept. Don't take any risk. But, you know, right. but I, I see this as a huge problem uh, and, and a reflection of a, a really bad tendency among the bar not to remember the critical social compact that led to the development of the establishment of our country. Um, the, you know, the, uh, the social compact that makes us all part of the government, makes the government part of us. Uh, you know, that essential connection between the citizen and the government. Why is it, it's a hard question, but why is it that American lawyers, so many, the majority, if not the great majority, don't see this? They don't realize, they don't recognize what you've been talking about. I, I, I wish I knew the answer. What I, what I am in, in encountering, I think, is generally uh, a shared view by many, many, many lawyers that the system is rigged, that there is, the system is corrupt, uh, that somehow the government has become the enemy. I mean, I, I am intrigued by the, the fact that so many lawyers are so concerned about not being, are concerned about their own reputations, their own clients, uh, being perceived as in any way uh, critical of existing power. Remember that many of these uh, lawyers, at least in large big law, represent major corporations, represent Wall Street firms, all of whom are doing well. And most of those corporate executives are not taking positions at all in these things. Uh, others, I look at many uh, legislative, uh, congressional people. I look at somebody like a Lindsey Graham. I look at somebody like uh, the, the, the senator from from Ohio, good, good lawyers, who, uh, at, including Mitt Romney, who are sitting, who are doing, not speaking at all to the issues about the rule of law. Uh, they may not like the person. They may not think that President United States should tweet. They don't think the President United States should be degrading, denigrating, criticizing people and bullying people. But they will not stand up because they're concerned about their own elections. They're concerned about being criticized by Fox, Fox News. They're, criti they're, turn they're, they're afraid that their base will turn on them. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I am convinced now, Jay, that the only answer here is going to be somehow that the people speak. You, you used the term. I mean, John Gardner spoke highly of these issues. Democracy is not a spectator sport. Uh, and this is a government of, by, and for the people. And his other third concept was that the most important office in a democracy is the office of citizen. Yeah. And frankly, we as citizens are failing dramatically to be engaged, to focus on some of these things. Now, some of these are legal concepts, and that's why lawyers I focus on particularly. I mean, maybe the average person does not understand why it's a problem when Congress issues a subpoena or request an executive agency for documents, uh, and that's viewed as partisan when, in fact, Congress has the responsibility to oversee the executive. Yeah, the essence of checks it. and balances. But let me take you. Let me and, take you to the last question, Scott, because we're almost out of time, and it's my uh, it's it's my what can we do about it question. So if, if I watch this show, if I listen to you, Scott, um, and if I you know appreciate, and I'm a lawyer, and I appreciate these things. But I haven't done anything yet. I haven't signed the letter. I haven't taken any affirmative steps. I've been trying to, you know, push it off to the side somehow and lead my life uh, independent of all these things that are happening. But I appreciate what you're saying, and I agree with what you're saying, and I want to do something. What do I do? Tell me what to do. I think the, the, the very first thing I would ask you to do, Jay, is to look at our open letter, go to our website, Lawyers Defending American Democracy, and do two things. One is look at the open letter and the statement of principles, and if you agree fundamentally with, uh, the, with our statement and our examples that we give, that you, you become a signer of that letter. The second thing is look at the other people who have signed. Look at the range of folks uh, who have already uh, joined this effort. And third, begin to look a bit at the things we've posted in terms of the the articles, the posts, and 
and, 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 and at the effort we're making be nonpartisan in dealing with this. Now, we're being challenged about that because many people think that you can no longer simply stand and focus just on describing things that you need, that we need somehow to take action and take a position on the impeachment specifically, that we need to take a position on that whether the Attorney General Barr is violating his oath, that many of the elected officials who are not not here are criticizing uh, the rule of law, are violating their oaths as lawyers. That is that kind of a attack syndrome, which we have tried to avoid because it simply seems to play into the general narrative. But, but my hope would be that if somebody does this, I would then like them to write a letter to their local newspaper and explain why they, as a lawyer, as a lawyer, uh, are concerned about what appear to be violations of core democracy principles. I would like them as, as, uh, as lawyers to reach out to their network of friends and simply say, I'm signing. I would be interested in, in having you sign this document as well. That's a and great idea. Look at the action plan that's under it. And there's, it's just, it, there's some simple steps here. Now, I'm not going to take the position that therefore we're going to change the world by doing it. But what I am going to say is that somebody, somebody's going to look back here and say, where were you uh, in the middle of these times of crisis? This, this, by the way, does not ask you to stop being a Republican if you're a Republican. It does not stop you from supporting the president if you support the president politically. It does, and the same way with Democrats. Be an advocate in the Civil Liberties Union. Be an advocate for lawyers for good government. Take on all the causes you want. All we're saying, in addition, is do what our fellow lawyers did when Archibald Cox was sacked <laughs> by President Nixon and stand and deliver as law, independent lawyers, as members of the legal profession, and say, this shall not stand. And we... We insist on the independence of this, and the result of that was, you will need to remember, it was Leon Jaworski, and that special counsel continued. Archibald Cox wasn't replaced, doesn't return, but they stood and delivered and made sure a good independent lawyer was. Thank you, thank you. Scott, we, we've, uh, we've, we've run out of time, I'm sorry. I hope we can continue this conversation, because what we've been talking about will continue. The same issues will rise up again. Uh, the same evolutions will be at hand. So I hope we can talk again. Scott Harshberger, former attorney general of the state of Massachusetts, uh, now a practicing lawyer in, in Boston. Uh, we greatly appreciate your appearance on ThinkTech. Honored to be here. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Scott. Aloha.